we're going to talk about lupus nephritis today. It's uh, an exciting field. It's an area that uh, in the last few years, there's been a lot of new developments. In the first 25 years of my career, there really was no real advances in lupus nephritis. In the last few years, there's been a lot. And um, about a year ago, we hired a new nephrologist, Andy Zhang. And uh, I thought this was a good opportunity for many of you to get to know him. He's running, helping us run in the uh, GN clinic. And he's also our EPIC builder. So uh, he's very good at EPIC. If you have any questions, he's the person to ask. Um, so he's, we're going to divide it into two. He's going to do a little bit of the background. Um, but, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the newer uh, therapies in the study. So Andy, will, Andy, it's all yours. Sorry, I just realized I was on mute. Uh, can people hear me now okay? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, so yeah, I'll take the first 20 minutes or so just to go over a background of the uh, lupus nephritis history, and then Dr. Ting will focus a little bit more on some of the newer therapies afterwards. So um, as most of you know, lupus is fairly common. And depending on which um, stats you look at and which country you look at, uh, it affects up somewhere between 50 to 100,000 per 100,000 people. The Lupus Foundation of America esti estimates about 1.1.5 million people in the U.S. are living with lupus. So their population is about 10 times that of ours, which means in Canada, we have about 150,000 people living with lupus. Um, again, depending on which stat you look at, the kidneys are affected in anywhere between 20 to 60% of the case, so potentially up to almost 100,000 people in Canada with lupus nephritis. Can be the presenting symptoms, but sometimes it shows up a couple of years after the initial SLE diagnosis. Uh, up to 30% of these will progress to end-stage renal disease. If we're using the same numbers, that's about 30,000 Canadians potentially on dialysis or with a transplant because of lupus. Um, there is definitely genetic predisposition. It's much higher in Black, Hispanic, and Asians. Um, there are some monogenetic mutation that leads to the development of lupus, which may be um, explained for some of this, but there is most likely other factors involved as well. And these subgroups also tend to have more aggressive disease. Uh, the physiology is similar to most autoimmune conditions, um, but some sort of endogenous nuclear material uh, is triggering the immune system. This can be some chromatin material, DNA uh, material. As mentioned, uh, some of the monogenetic mutations would be things like a DNA uh, ACE, the enzyme that breaks down DNA. If there's a defect there, at least to improper clearance of the DNA, that triggers the immune system and go um, takes off from there. And then B cell is a very important factor in the uh, pathophysiology of lupus, which Dr. Ting will get to in a little bit. Uh, these immune complex then can either deposit in the kidney as a result of circulation, or sometimes the antibodies can form directly against certain um, native uh, kidney molecules in the example of annexin 2 And then the um, immune system activation from here mm -hmm. on causes damage and injury. Uh, the complement system, it's a key um, pathway that's involved. It is cl classically associated with the classical pathway. Oh, I can actually see my mouse. So the um, C4 gets consumed, C3 gets consumed as part of the common pathway, C1 gets consumed and generates a C1Q, which is a byproduct. So typically, when we think about lupus, we think about low C4, C3, and an elevated C1Q level. This we don't directly measure, but it's something we do stain for on the kidney biopsy. Now, there is more and more evidence that the alternate pathway that's also being um, utilized in the pathogenesis of lupus. And this traditionally has been with um, atypical HUS, is where the um, and MPG um, diseases is where the alternate pathway gets uh, the most attention focused on. In terms of the clinical presentation, in terms of lupus nephritis, the, it is very diverse. So you can have very asymptomatic um, patients where the only abnormality is something abnormal on the urine. Um, they may have a little bit of proteinuria, typically not to the range of nephrotic syndrome, and they typically do not have clinical nephrotic syndrome. And the more... Um, more serious disease are these proliferative lupus nephritis. You can have a mixture of blood protein, um, abnormal renal function. And these are the group that most of the trials and therapies are focusing on. And then you have the um, 
this, for those that know the classification, this would be sort of the class five um, lupus, where they tend to be non-proliferative, but they present more with nephrotic syndrome. And then you have a bunch of lupus associated that's not technically not lupus nephritis. So lupus polycythopathy, it's a minimal change like condition that does not have much of the immunofluorescence, the immune activation system, but more of a basement membrane disease. You have the thrombotic angiopathy with antiphospholipid syndrome. You can have certain types of RTAs and interstitial nephritis that comes with lupus, and there's other um, systemic um, involvement as well. Uh, biopsy is the gold standard. Um, there is more and more emerging evidence that um, the clinical presentation do not correlate with um, the biopsy findings. So sometimes you can have just very mild urinalysis and then you do a biopsy and you see raging lupus happening in the kidneys. So the, the question is always, when is the best time to biopsy? And there's some guidelines, but for the most part, um, ends up being a clinical judgment. Just a little bit of background on the classification of lupus. So the WHO classification was originally designed in 1975, which did not include class six lupus. They had a modification about seven years later that introduces the class six and also some subdivisions into the different types of lupus. Uh, so some people will refer to this as the WHO classification, uh, but the main one that most people are using is the 2003 International Society of Nephrology and Renal Path Society. This um, introduced some quantitative scoring system, talks about acuity, chronicity. The core is similar to the 1982 WHO um, classification, but there are some changes there. And then there was actually another update about five years ago. Uh, this one is more to the pathologist, doesn't change the clinician's um, role as much. They sort of tried to uh, be a little bit more clear on what certain words mean. They change the wording of some stuff, but for the most part, it's not that different from 2003. Uh, so the findings on biopsy, uh, typically it's described as a mesangial proliferative disease. Um, so that's where the class one and two are talking about, but there's also some vascular involvement. That's usually where class three and four comes in. You can see crescents. We'll talk a little bit more about the findings later in the, um, the specific classification. Immunofluorescence is um, usually described as a full house pattern, kind of like a um, hand of poker cards where you have three immunoglobulins and you have two complements that makes your three of a kind and the pair. And electron microscopy, you can have deposit in different places, but subendothelial deposit, you see it more in proliferative GN. Um, so sort of these ones over here. Subepithelial deposit, you see it more in class five lupus, which is the nephrotic syndrome membranous um, lupus nephritis. And tubular reticular inclusion body, it's a commonly um, seen finding. The other area where this shows up commonly is HIV. So just a brief summary of the classification. I won't focus too much more on the left and the middle, but we'll just look a little bit on the right. So if you can see from the most part, the main category of the classification didn't change much. One and two um, is sort of a progression from um, essentially minimal or no mesangial involvement to having more involvement. Three and four, you're getting more proliferation where you got focal to diffuse uh, lupus nephritis. They changed the wording a little bit. And then class five is your membranous, um, which is more nephrotic syndrome. And class six is essentially a burnt out uh, lupus nephritis where you're starting dialysis planning, you're uh, doing your stage five CKD education and there's not much therapeutic role at that point. Uh, in terms of management, there was a GN update to the KDGO guideline in 2021 that did incorporate a lot of the recent um, literature there, which is nice. I think the previous update was at least 10, 15, if not 20 years prior. So the first recommendation in their treatment part is everyone with lupus should be on a plaque note. Most of this literature is from the um, systemic lupus literature. There was a Canadian lupus study that looked at um, people that came off Plaquenil and they had a higher risk of relapse compared to people with Plaquenil. Uh, the typical dosing is roughly around 400 milligrams a day for an average um, uh, for an average size adult. In the maintenance phase, you can lower it a little bit. And then in the um, lower GFR group, you can reduce the dose a little bit. So somewhere between 200 and 400, it's a pretty common dose uh, that most people end up on. And then the 
uh, main thing is ideally you want a baseline retinal exam and then you want an annual or at least biannual uh, eye exam to make sure there's no retinal toxicity from plaque window. In terms of class one and two lupus management, uh, it's mostly conservative treatment and observation-based therapy. Now, in the right here, the nephrotic syndrome here, um, the suggestion is to assess for lupus photocytopathy, which is a, uh, it's still an immune media process, but less immune than the typical lupus nephritis you think about. And if you do pick that up, you would treat it uh, very similar to minimal change disease. And then for people with sort of um, low amount of proteinuria, maybe a little bit of hematuria, normal kidney function, the treatment is primarily guided by the non-renal manifestation. So our rheumatology colleagues usually sort of take over the care and we do more of the conservative care involving um, RAS inhibition and then uh, SGLT2 inhibitors, the new one. So for class three and four is where predominantly the literature comes from. Um, this is where uh, immunosuppressive therapy is needed. You need a steroid backbone. Uh, the traditional therapy is cyclophosphamide. There are sort of two main protocols that came out of this. One was the original NIH and then a reduced dose uh, urolupus protocol that came about 15 years after. Uh, there is more and more preference leaning towards mycophenolate or um, uh, like salsep or myphoretic for mycophenolic acid and mycophenolate mofetil just because the ease of administration. And then the studies are showing some signal towards better efficacy in certain ethnic um, groups, which are the ethnic population that tends to have more lupus presentation. We'll talk a little bit more about this triple therapy. It was a study came out of China about seven or eight years ago that looked at reduced dose uh, MMF, low dose tac uh, with low dose prednisone, and they achieved pretty good promising results. Cyclosporin is another um, sort of family of medication that is being used. I think the original cyclosporin studies actually came out in the 80s and 90s, but didn't really pick up much favor. Tacrolimus picked up in the mid 2000s, um, and also not a lot of um, interest. And then it was really, I think, after this multi-targeted therapy, that's where the CNI family took off. Vocalosporin is the newest one in this family. Uh, it's got a better uh, pharmacokinetic, a more predictable pharmacokinetic, and there's no drug monitoring that's involved. So from a medications um, perspective, it is a good medication that I think will be very helpful. The main issue with vocalosporin is cost. Um, the estimated cost last time I looked is somewhere between 40 to 80,000 a year. So cost alone, I think most people will steer away from this until it becomes much, much, much cheaper. And then belimumab or Benlista is the um, sort of the new player in the, uh, in the, uh, in the game. And then Dr. Ting will focus a little bit more about it. The study was Bliss Elton that came out about two years ago. Uh, steroid. So I think there, every study you look at will have a slightly different steroid dosing as with every other steroid, like disease that requires steroid. Uh, it's mostly expert opinion. And I think I find on average, nephrologists tends to be worse than rheumatologists that we tend to go slower on the steroid than our rheumatology colleagues. So it was nice that KDGO actually gave some suggestion in the 2021 guideline. The standard regimen is what most people were using previously. Uh, reduce dose to me seems a little bit too aggressive. Um, so I tend to settle somewhere in the moderate dose. Now, if someone has really severe disease, I probably shift a little bit more to the right. If someone has mild disease, I might shift a little bit more to the right. Um, so this will be sort of the main focus for the next few minutes is talking about some of the major trials um, in the history of lupus nephritis. So 1986 was the original NIH study that I talked about. This, uh, when people refer to the standard cyclophosphamide dosing, this is where it came from. They had about 100 patients. They compared um, the use of cytotoxic therapy with, sorry, uh, they compare steroid with and without cytotoxic toxic therapy, and they found people on cyclophosphamide did a lot better. Uh, and then uh, there was sort of a follow-up study about 10 years later that looked at steroid alone versus cyclophosphamide versus the combination of both, and they said the combination was better than either one alone. So these sort of, uh, by the late 90s, early 2000s, um, steroid and cyclophosphamide became more or less the only therapy for lupus nephritis. <clears throat> 
this is a smaller group that sort of introduced the idea of microphenolate and then um, but the main microphenolate study came out in 2009 which I'll talk about in a little bit so in early 2000 Eurolupus was the next sort of major trial that look at low versus standard dosing cyclophosphamide so standard dosing you're looking at somewhere around 750 to a gram usually um, every month for six doses so your cumulative doses you're looking at maybe about six grams total where this is six doses of 500 so you're at about half of the dose compared to the standard um, therapy and there is a risk of cumulative lifetime dose of cyclophosphamide uh, that if you reach the sort of 20 25 gram lifetime dose your risk of bladder cancer goes way up so most people can have about two of the full NIH protocol and maybe sort of a half of another NIH protocol before the bladder cancer risk goes up. So for Eurolupus, using those same numbers, you can maybe get by with four to five, maybe even up to six uh, treatment of this for future uh, relapses. 2009, ELMS was the main study that sort of brought uh, microphenolate into the um, lupus realm. So they looked at mycophenolate versus cyclophosphamide as induction therapy, and they found MMF was non-inferior. And in fact, they did better in certain um, ethnic population. So this was the induction therapy for mycophenolate. Uh, for everyone who completed the study, they were offered to continue on to mycophenolate uh, maintenance therapy versus imiran. Um, off of 300 people, just over two thirds sort of entered the maintenance study, which found mycophenolate was superior in the sense of preventing uh, relapse. And also there was a less side effect profile. So the mycophenolate became more preferred in terms of the maintenance therapy as well over azathioprine. Um, in between these two, the maintained study came out that looked at the same comparison essentially as the 2011 ELMS. Uh, and they look at uh, mycophenolate versus azathioprine maintenance. They've said this study concluded there were similar efficacy, but there was a bit more side effect in Uh Lunar people were sort of hoping for promising results. I think I got the date wrong. It should be 2012, not 2022. Uh, because B cell is involved in the pathogenesis of lupus, uh, rituximab as an anti B cell therapy was presumed to be effective, but really. It was a negative trial that uh, did not see any clinical impact. They did see that the level of double-strand DNA improved, and I think complement factors also improved, but there was no clinical, um, uh, clinical outcome that was picked up. And then the 2015 Chinese study that looked at the multi-targeted therapy um, sort of touched on earlier, it's a combination of calcineurin inhibitor, mycophenolate, and prednisone, and they found comparing to standard cyclophosphamide and prednisone, and they said this was superior to the uh, traditional NIH protocol. Uh, Bliss LN came out two years ago. I won't focus much on this now, but the bottom line was that bilimumab was superior to placebo. Um, the standard induction therapy was still used as part of this, so bilimumab was used as an add-on to existing therapy. And then the Aurora was the study looking at voclosporin that came out sort of shortly after Bliss. Um, it was a positive study, so there was no doubt about that. It's, I think the cost was very limiting. There was a, if some of you might have heard of something called Aura lupus nephritis, that was about three years prior to this, which was the dose finding study for voclosporin. So I just included their final publication. Um, so induction therapy, um, we sort of talked about a little bit earlier, there's just the slides again. Um, moving on to the maintenance phase, uh, because of those studies that was presented, mycophenolic acid or um, MMF became the preferred uh, maintenance therapy. Second line is Imiran for people that do not tolerate it, and also for people in pregnancy, Imiran will be the um, maintenance therapy. Tacotomus or other cyclosporine inhibitors is not typically used as a monotherapy for maintenance, um, but can be considered if none of the other things work. Um, or I think a low dose in combination with one of the two may be an option. Um, Kediko also talks about this medication called mesorabine, which I really don't know much of anything about. And then the in terms of duration of maintenance therapy, um, there's no science to it. The guideline says should you keep it for at least three years, but after that, no one really knows. Most of the study have ended by about three or four years, 
So uh, what a lot of us would do is have a conversation with the patient. If things are looking okay, we, you can try to taper down the dose um, uh, to as low as possible. And then the question to stop becomes more of a conversation with the patient, what the risk is. At fairly low doses, most of these medications are very well tolerated with a very minimal side effect. Now, some of you might notice these medications are virtually the same as the transplant uh, medications. So uh, even though we don't have a lot of long-term actual clinical trials looking at the long-term of these medications, uh, there's a lot of literature from the transplant um, literatures. Class five. Uh, this one is a little bit different um, in the sense none of the trials, if you um, think about it, really look at specifically class five lupus. Uh, but class five lupus are typically enrolled in every single one of the trials, somewhere between 10 to 20 percent of the population, usually consists of pure class five. Um, so the, the therapy uh, in general, when there's a combination of class three and four and five, the therapy, you would just treat them the same as class three or four, because that's the proliferative, the more, um, the more uh, rip roaring lupus. From most subgroup analysis, and there's some smaller RCTs looking at um, pure class five, cyclophosphamide should work, mycophenolate should work. Uh, there's not so much uh, specific medication looking at cyclosporin, but there is non-immune um, effects of cyclosporin that talks about protocyte stabilization, uh, which is one of the main reasons it's being used in um, minimal change disease and FSGS as a sterosparing agent. So perhaps there's more role for the CNIs in the people that presents with more of a class five uh, picture. So for myself, if someone is pure class three or four or with very minimal proteinuria, I may not add the cyclosporin, but if they're coming in with uh, lots of proteinuria, nephrotic syndrome, in addition to other findings, then I may consider using the multi-targeted therapy where the mycophenolate and the CNI together with the story might bring people into remission faster. Um, just a few points about the pregnancy in itself. Uh, timing wise, again, there's no science to this. Uh, generally, uh, the more active the disease is, the worse the outcome, just because there's risk to the um, fetus, the medications, some of them are cytotoxic to the baby, and also the, um, the pregnancy itself is a trigger for worsening lupus flare. So some will say, wait for six months after lupus becomes quiescent, uh, or wait a year after lupus is in remission before considering pregnancy. And then prior to that, the medication will need to be switched. So these three are considered relatively safe in pregnancy, Plaquenil, Imiran, and Cyclosporin. Imiran and Cyclosporin are what the transplant people will be on going through pregnancy. Um, Mycophenolate is not safe. RAS inhibitor is not safe. SGLT2, I didn't talk too much about. There's no specific data on lupus, but there's a lot of data nowadays in non-diabetic kidney disease, especially in the proteinuric form. Um, and IgA is a big section of that population. So we're borrowing some of those, uh, extrapolating some of those data that the, it should be a non-immune mediated, um, perhaps renal perfusion effect, perhaps other effects that we don't know about that can, um, that is very effective at reducing proteinuria. And then um, blimumab being a, such a relatively new medication, um, they say not recommended in pregnancy, but there is pregnancy registry that so far has not shown any major side effects. So I probably wouldn't start someone if they're pregnant, but if they are pregnant, if they're already on it and they do end up becoming pregnant, um, I most likely will not stop the medication, just enroll them into the registry to get more data. Uh, just sort of last a little bit before I pass the mic over to Dr. Ting. Uh, one thing just to be mindful of with all the lupus literature, uh, if you look into the fine print, their response, how they measure response is all different. The Even within the major guidelines, uh, the American College of Rheumatology and the KDGO, which is the main uh, renal guideline, talks about different uh, markers for complete remission, partial remission. And if you look at all the study trials, everything comes with a slightly different number. Some uses 0.5, some uses 0.3, some uses 0.7. So there's a lot of variation when you're interpreting the numbers um, across different uh, study. And sometimes if you move the dial a little bit from say 0.5 to 0.7, you may get a different response. And uh, I will pass it off to actually, I guess we'll do questions at the end or what do you think? 
Um, let me see the chat. Uh, so I think I'll pass the mic and the screen over to Dr. Ting first, and then people can enter the question in the chat, and we can sort of address them at the end. Can you stop your screen share so I can share my screen? Yep. So thank you, um, Andy. Um, I, this is a, I want to talk about a case that I just saw in um, um, in GN Clinic um, last week. I saw a patient probably for the very last time. Um, she's in her late 40s. I started treating her almost 30 years ago. And, um, you know, 30 years ago, we really did not have a lot of other drugs. We were using steroids, uh, cyclophosphamide. Uh, we didn't even really have Celsep in those days. We had Imiran. And, uh, and she, she'll admit she was pretty bad as in her 20s. She stopped medications a lot. I had to pulse her many, many times, retreat her many times. And her creatinine now is about 150. But over the years, she's had bilateral avascular necrosis of her hips. She's had avascular necrosis in her shoulders. Um, I got her through one pregnancy. Um, and now she's got severe myelodysplasia. She had a neutrophil count of 0 0.4, and she was just turned down for a bone marrow transplant at Sunnybrook, and they told her she had 12 to 14 months to live. And so I saw her in GM clinic, and this is sort of, this is a lady in her late 40s, and, you know, it's very, very sad because, you know, it would be the last time I ever see her. I gave her a hug, and we said goodbye. I said, the next visit we'll just do by telephone. And really, this is what we're trying to present. Lupus is a disease of young women, these are usually women in their 20s and 30s, and they end up on dialysis around the age of 40. So if you look at the chance of kidney failure at five years, it's about 11%. At 10 years, it's 17%. By 15 years, it's 22%. By 20 years, it's 30%. So we have a disease where one in three women will eventually end up on dialysis and at pretty at pretty young age. So I just wanted to touch, uh, overlap a little bit with Andy, I want to talk about some of the new drugs we're using. So we're using rituximab. Uh, the lunar study was the first rituximab study. And basically, this was rituximab on top of MMF and steroids. And even though there was a serological benefit with lower complement and double-stranded DNA, there was no improvement in clinical outcomes. The only rituximab study, there was a loop study, um, which also looked at rituximab and methylprednisolone in addition to MNF. And this was done by Liz Lightstone. What they were able to show is they didn't use any prednisone. So at 52 weeks, you know, 52% of the patients had complete remission, 34% had partial response. So they basically saying if you use rituximab, pulse solumedrol, you don't need to give people uh, oral steroids, which is a huge benefit, really. If you look at all the drugs that we give patients, we're worried about cyclophosphamide, but I'm pretty sure that prednisone is probably the worst uh, drug that we give our patients. These patients have high risk for osteoporosis, avascular necrosis, premature coronary artery disease, um, diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, if we can get them off the steroids, I think that's probably the most important thing. Voclisborn, I don't think is gonna come to Canada. Retail price in the United States is $92,000 US per year. Um, and uh, I just don't see it coming to Canada. Uh, we can't even get to Crolimus as for a calcineurin inhibitor. Um, and uh, we are still using mostly cyclosporin because it's what's available. But voclosporin in the Aurora trial basically showed superiority when used in combination with MMF. Um, and I think the trend really in treating lupus is for uh, proliferative like three and four, it's probably good to use MMF. Most people occasionally cyclophosphamide. Uh, if you have five, then I think the trend is to usually add a calcineurin inhibitor, such as cyclosporin to the regimen. And when you do use a calcineurin inhibitor, it does allow you to maybe back off a little bit on the MMF dosage. We'll talk a little bit about uh, in belimumab or Benlista, like why are we using it? So we know that only 30% of lupus patients have a complete response treatment. And we also know that the initial response and how much the proteinuria comes down really is the best predictor of how well you're gonna do long-term. And we know that um, one, one in six of the lupus nephritis patients go into kidney failure um, by 10 years. 
and we know that if you have proliferative nephritis, about one in three uh, will be in kidney failure by 20 years. Spolimumab is a human monoclonal antibody that it inhibits the B cell activating factor. And we know that BAF is uh, increased in B cell mediated autoimmune diseases like lupus, and it controls B cell maturation. So the BLIS study was really looking at using uh, bolimumab, um, and they compared it to standard to care therapy. Um, and uh, I'll go through the study in more detail, but basically the primary uh, endpoint for renal endpoint was really looking at at two years, looking at the uh, proteinuria less than 0 0.7 grams. So uh, the primary endpoint was 0 0.7 grams protein. The reason they use 0.7 grams is there's been a lot of studies now showing that if you can get proteinuria down to 0.7 grams, that uh, it confers a very good uh, long-term outcome. Complete response is usually they're aiming for lower, about 0.5 grams, and the GFR can't be more than 10% above the baseline. And they also looked at uh, renal-related death. They also looked at other endpoints such as uh, time to first flare, a 30-40% decline in GFR, a sustained decline in GFR, and they also looked at the eGFR slope. So the patient, the patient demographics of the study really were about a third of the patients were uh, Caucasian, half were Asian. Um, there was a lot of, uh, about one in eight was Afro-Caribbean descent. And you can see young, these patients had lupus for about three years and generally pretty young. They're in their early 30s. So this is a disease of young women. And basically, uh, you can see here that the uh, most of the patients were class three or four or had three and four with five. Class five, the pure membranous, so the patients that present with uh, nephrotic syndrome, heavy proteinuria, it was about one in six patients. And you can see the baseline values there. Most of the patients, about three quarters were treated with MMF, about a quarter were treated with cyclophosphamide. I think that sort of goes with what we're doing right now. We're using a lot more MMF than we're using cyclophosphamide. Um, I think cyclophosphamide is generally reserved for the sicker patients. And you'll see later in terms of response, uh, they may be the more res uh, disease resistant patients because they're often the sicker patients. If you look at the primary efficacy of renal response, which is really looking at for a protein creatinine uh, down to 0.7 gram, uh, you can see that overall there was a benefit, 43% versus 32%. And these numbers are, look kind of pathetic, right? Like you think, wow, like, you know, you're, you're doing um, 43, it's a 10% improvement, which is significant. Um, but you can see, look in the control arm, only 32, one in three patients actually get to the target protein area that confers good outcome. You can see that there were not that many people in the uh, cyclophosphamide azathioprine arm, so it does not reach statistical significance where there is significance with the pure MMF group, 46% uh, versus 34%. If you look in, in terms of proteinuria, overall there's benefit. Uh, this was actually seen in the people with lower proteinuria, so less than three grams per day. 54% uh, uh, went had a protein uh, level of less than 0.7 grams at two years compared to only 33% of the control arm. And you can see that for the heavy proteinuria patients, they did not reach significance. And it could be that it's not a reasonable um, target. If you have membranous nephropathy and uh, you know we see some people with over 30 grams of protein, if the protein comes down to two grams from 30, it, I don't think that's necessarily a treatment failure, but in this case of the study using the strict definition, they would have been called a treatment failure. If you look at the classes of lupus, uh, not surprisingly, three or four, which is usually with pure, have less proteinuria. There, there's significant benefit, 47 versus 31%. Uh, with, or, with five included, it's, um, it crosses unity. And you can see the pure fives, really, there's no uh, evidence of any benefit in terms of the uh, primary uh, renal outcome. If you look at complete response again, three and four, um, uh, beneficial, but not with five. And if you look at the, um, okay, let's skip through these all very, very similar. You get the drift basically, three and four, the people with low proteinuria, they do well. The people with high proteinuria, uh, there does not to, seem to be significant benefit. If you look at time to a renal event or renal death, you can see that basically it didn't matter which class, generally the people on belimumab had uh, lesser time to renal death or renal event. They're also more less likely to have a lupus flare. Uh, 
So the people that were on belimumab were less likely to have a flare. If you think of belimumab, how we generally give it in our through our clinics is uh, uh, you can give it intravenously. Uh, usually it's every two weeks initially for the first few weeks and then once a month. Uh, but most of our patients are getting it uh, subcutaneously once a week. And, uh, you know, I think in terms of compliance and adherence, it's going to be way better. Um, our lupus patients are probably the most difficult patients in terms of adherence. Uh, these are young women. They don't want to look fishinoid. So it's quite common for people to stop their steroid medications and flare. Um, and so belimumab, I think, has a big advantage in that um, it's more tolerable. It doesn't have the terrible steroid side effects. And it's injection uh, once a week. Um, and it's probably easier to make sure that patients are taking their medication. You can see that in terms of uh, lupus flares, it didn't matter what the underlying disease was. Um, three, four, or five, you can see there's less flares when you're on belimumab, which is, I think, a huge advantage in this patient population. We know that every patient, every time you flare, you lose some kidney function, you never regain your full kidney function, and that's eventually caused uh, chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal failure. If you look at the eGFR slopes, you can see that the patients on belimumab, the GFR is going down by about 0.99 mLs per minute per year versus 3.18 in the standard of care therapy. Um, and so basically, um, you know, it's really slowing the rate of uh, decline uh, in GFR. In terms of GFR declining by 30 or 40%, again, much lower with belimumab. Okay. The drug really is very, very safe. If you look, compare it to uh, people on the placebo arm, there was no signal to show any increase in side effects. There were no fatal side effects. Um, there was no increase in uh, any infections. And I think that's the real advantage of this medication. It's generally very, very well tolerated. Um, there are ongoing studies now using um, rituximab together with belimumab in lupus nephritis. It's also being studied in membranous nephropathy and other kidney diseases, because I think one of the issues when you take drugs like rituximab is your bliss levels actually go up initially. And so the idea is maybe covering them with belimumab at the same time to reduce some of these autoreactive antibodies. So basically, I think in summary, belimumab did improve renal response um, at two years. Um, it did not show this in the uh, class five in the high proteinuria subgroup. So at this time, I probably would give it to patients with class three and four, plus or minus five. But for the pure five patients, I probably would not use belimumab at this point in time. Um, in terms of the overall population, the risk of renal-related death, lupus flares were much lower for belimumab in all patients. And basically, there was a slowing of the rate of decline of kidney function. The GFR slope was a much low, uh, slower decline with belimumab. And there was less likely to have a 30 to 40% decline in GFR when you're on belimumab. And the safety data was very, very good. So it really had minimum and minimal side effects and allowed patients to reduce their uh, prednisone dosage um, much more quickly. I think the overall steroid use in the belimumab arm was 63% lower than the control arm. Now, some comments about the actual bliss study is the patients were, only one third of patients were on RAS blockade, which we know probably is suboptimal. Most of these patients should all be on sub, uh, RAS blockade. Um, I think they should, all should be on the SGLT2 inhibitor. SGLT2 inhibitor studies excluded lupus because these are patients that are often on steroids, so they didn't want them confounding their results. But because of all the other glomerular proteinuric diseases showing benefit, um, it makes sense to consider using a, um, a SGLT2 inhibitor on these patients. Uh, whether we would use drugs like non-steroidal mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists such as finerenone remains to be seen, but sometimes we will use drugs like spironolactone if the proteinuria is very, very heavy. Um, everyone should be on hydroxychloroquine. Um, and um, I think all of them should also be on a statin. These patients are at really, really high risk for cardiovascular disease. So um, there's a lot of data now in glomerular diseases showing that use of statins actually slows the rate of progression of uh, chronic kidney disease. So CADIS really decides whether drugs get reimbursed or not. And, uh, you know, belimumab is actually not a new drug. It's been around uh, since the early 2011, 2012. Um, generally, rheumatologists have a lot more experience than nephrologists using this drug because it's been used for just lupus, general lupus symptoms. But the specific indication in Canada that CADAT approved, approved was for lupus nephritis. 
And basically this is what CADF has recommended. They're still in the negotiation process. So some of this may change, but the recommendation is for volumumab has been approved for use in class three, four, or three, four with five. Um, they want a biopsy uh, within six months, which is problematic for a lot of us because when our patients flare, for example, if they stop medication and they flare, we don't usually biopsy them, we just treat them. So um, hopefully we'll get some um, flexibility on the biopsy date of six months. They also want the steroid induction therapy within 60 days of initiation of treatment. I think this really uh, puts us under the gun. Um, you know, for example, a lot of times the steroids and the induction is actually um, done outside a glomerular nephritis clinic. Um, so we're asking basically for if you have a case like this, uh, if you are starting, to please refer the patient to the GN clinic at the Scarborough um, General Hospital as soon as possible so that we can get the paperwork going for the Belimum map. Um, the initial authorization is good for 12 months. Uh, they will not cover people if the GFR is below 30, which um, is unfortunate in the sense that I think a lot of people, when they flare initially, their GFR may dip below 30, but they actually may be the ones that benefit the most. Um, they don't want people that have failed both cyclophosphamide and MMF together, but if you've only failed one of them, that's fine. Um, renewal, basically, you have to be on less than 7.5 milligrams of prednisone a day by 12 months and your GFR cannot be more than 20% uh, below the pre values or above 60. And basically they want the proteinuria less than 0 0.7 grams by 12 months if the baseline was subnephrotic. If you were nephrotic at baseline, you have two years to get the proteinuria down to 0 0.7 grams. Okay, so um, those are the thresholds. And basically once the GFR below 30, or if you're in other uh, immunosuppressive agents, basically um, you, um, cannot uh, stay on the medication. So I think I'll open it up right now and we can have um, a discussion. Are there any questions or are there, is, is there anything in the chat box? Sorry, I haven't been monitoring the chat box. Uh, nothing in the chat right now. Okay. So yeah, I think you know, lupus. Lupus is a bad disease. If you have lupus and you have kidney disease, your risk goes way up. Our current therapies are suboptimal. Um, you know, if I told you we have a disease affecting 20-year-olds and one third of them are going to be on dialysis or dead by the time they're 40, you would say, well, that's not a very good. That's not a very good uh, response. So anything that actually can actually improve the lives of these people uh, will be beneficial. I think Benlista will actually be cost-effective. The um, retail price in the United States is 43,000 US. I think in Canada, it's gonna be closer to 25,000 Canadian. I don't know what the final price the government's gonna negotiate, maybe even lower than that. Um, the cost of dialysis is over $100,000 a year. So, um, and you know the duration of Benlista, people are talking maybe three years uh, uh, of Benlista. So you know, twenty-five thousand a year times three years, seventy-five thousand to uh, really change the tra trajectory uh, long term. You know, a lot of things in uh, medicine have a uh, um, you know, like for example, if you treat diabetes and you control the sugars well early on, you have you get that benefit that continues on. And I think with lupus, basically. If we can get a good initial response and get the proteinuria down, these patients will do much better over the long term. The initial response is very, very important. And you can see in the studies, even uh, with Benlista, we're hitting like 43% versus 32%. So there's still a lot of room to go. There's a lot of new drugs. There's a drug called anafrilamab, which is an anti-interferon receptor antibody drug that showed some benefit, but didn't reach its primary target. Uh, there's another anti-CD20 antibody called albinutuzumab, uh, which looks very, very promising. Um, it looks like it's going to be much better than rituximab. Um, and then there's studies really looking at these drugs in combination, using rituximab together with belimumab uh, and their various combinations. I think the way of the future really is using uh, combination therapies and using these more than one drug together. Any questions? Why don't you turn your camera on, Andy, so that uh, you can help me answer the question. Uh, 
Do you have any questions, Paul? I'm glad there's some. I think this exciting that we have new, more new things that we can, you know, we can help these patients. Used to be a, <clears throat> in my era, we, it's a steroid and cycle. So yeah. it's as, as bad as it gets. And um, anyway, that's good. Yeah. The patient that I, that I, you know, I hugged her and said goodbye to her for the last time. I was so sad because I've looked after her. She was one of my first patients when I started 30 years ago. And I've been looking after her all this time. And this is the final endpoint, though. Like, you know, I've wiped out her bone marrow. I've killed her bones. Her kidneys are fine. She doesn't need dialysis, but everything else is wiped out. You know, yeah. it's terrible. You, you know, when I uh, when I started out, I was doing, um, you know, uh, transplant work with uh, Carl Cadella. And Dr. Cadella treated a lot of lupus as well. And then uh, I, he, I still remember what he said to me. He said, we 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 give we make these all these people with so many complications that they, they they got us to, uh, their hips are gone and everything's gone and then he said to me I still remember he said to me one day Paul I think what we should do is to to get all these people into renal failure because that is a good immunosuppressive state that's better than giving them all these drugs I still remember that yeah we'll see how Cadella next week I'll I'll tell him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, failure is, is a good immunosuppressant, but I actually have a patient on my corporate drive uh, shift that is having rip roaring lupus vasculitis on dialysis. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, and she's on a euro lupus protocol getting uh, bi weekly uh, cyclophosphamide intravenously. Uh, I think she's being followed by Zahi Tuma at the lupus clinic downtown. So, some people just have terrible. Terrible, terrible disease. And right. we see a ton in Scarborough because, you know, the Asian women are yep. one of the high risk demographics, right? South, Chinese, Southern yeah. Chinese, like Hong Kong, that area, lots of lupus. Yep. So we, we're in a hotbed. I was in Cambodia in February and I saw more lupus patients in one day than I see in a year in Scarborough. Like it was just, you know, I had yep. COVID at the time. So I couldn't see, actually couldn't see them. The students told me about the cases, but I had over 30 lupus patients in wow. one day at, in Cambodia. And so I think it's very, very prevalent in Southeast Asia. Yeah. Anyway, well, good. Well, thank you guys. It was good, good, good review on all the things. Yeah. Hopefully, yeah, we can, we can look at more as time comes on. Yeah, I think long-term um, it would be nice maybe to do like nephrology, rheumatology, combined rounds, um, you know, maybe quarterly or once every six months where we can actually maybe get Rohan John to come review yeah. the renal biopsies and we can talk, we can discuss like co-management of these people. I mean, because yeah. a lot of times is like, where does the nephrology start and where does the rheumatology start or yeah. whatnot? Yeah. And I, I agree with Andy. I think we're using, we're not being aggressive enough in tapering steroids. Okay. Like I think the steroid Taper, you know, the three you showed, Andy, I like the one on the right the best, the best like the rapid, rapid taper, because I, I think it's good, but, you know, it's scary for people when they're not used to tapering that quickly, right? Even with the Vacapan, um, you know, getting people down to 20 milligrams within two or three weeks, people kind of like freak out a little bit, right? We have this sick ankylvasculitis in the IC right now, and, you know, they're so sick, it's like, you know, Convincing people to taper the steroids when the patients are sick is very, very hard. Yeah. I think the next topic you uh, we can do uh, immediate topic we can do with the rheumatologist on, is on vasculitis. I mean, there are new new things coming out, treatment and everything. So I think we should uh, look into it. Yeah. We'll get Steve Wong to do the next one. I saw Steve was on the call, so <laughs> <laughs> take care. Uh, Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Okay. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone.